welcome to the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment Faith and Politics Panel, at the 50th anniversary of the NGO CSW New York, which works with the United Nations to facilitate a platform for the voices and leadership of feminists and women's rights organizations to the Equal Rights Amendment Faith and Politics panel presentation at the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women's 50th Anniversary Convention, hosted by Katrina's Dream, an eco means eco. As the Bishop of Botswana, I speak to you tonight as a man of faith, and as President of UNIP, the oldest political party in Zambia, I speak to you as a man of politics, leading my country in the 21st century in promoting equality for everyone, everywhere. I'm inspired in my faith and politics by what Charles Peggy, the French poet and writer, wisely discerned, that everything begins in mysticism and ends in politics. This is the connection of how faith and politics relate. It begins with spirituality, which sees that our engagement in politics is a consequence of our participation in God's love. It begins with the awareness that God's love is the energy of creation, of a flowing and embracing all of life. And we are invited to be channels of this transforming power of love. This is the essence of our being, centering all our life and actions. It is this all-embracing love Jesus Christ demonstrated by his love for his enemies, his non-violent response to evil, his embrace of the marginalized, his condemnation of religious hypocrites, his, his compassion for the poor, his disregard for boundaries of social exclusion, his advocacy for the economically oppressed, his teachings that all people are equal, men and women, it all flowed from his participation in God's love. The politics of Jesus presents a clear agenda for equality, for we are all God's children. This is what informs my politics and faith. On January 17th, 2022, which was Religious Freedom Day, President Biden said, we must continue our work to ensure that people of all faiths, or none, are treated as full participants in society, equal in rights and dignity. We can only fully realize the freedom we wish for ourselves by helping to ensure liberty for all. Inequality is evil, and yet every evil is redeemable. 
and woman is God's gift to that end. She carries a torch and it passes from one generation to the next, bringing wisdom and equality. I believe the enshrinement of the Equal Rights Amendment into the United States of America's Constitution is the next essential step in the country for the full inclusion of women in the church and in society. As I look to the horizon, I see a beautiful United States built on a solid foundation of love, peace, justice, and equality, where men and women, black and white, straight and gay, are equal. For we are all one in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. God, our creator, you need us to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with you. Fill our hearts with your love and the desire for justice for all our brothers and sisters. May we nurture justice and equality for every human being and end all divisions and discrimination to create a human society built on love and peace. Amen. And so, my brothers and sisters, the blessing. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Show love to everyone. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. I'd like to thank Bishop Trevor for his wonderful uh, introduction. And hereby, I would like to introduce my uh, Vice President at Equal Means Equal, the great Natalie White. Hello, thank you, Kamala. Today, we are going to learn from the faith leaders on the front line and here in the USA and all around the world. We're going to hear their personal stories working with communities across the Equal Rights Amendment into the United States Constitution. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. And now I'd like to introduce the moderator for tonight and producer of the documentary film Equal Means Equal and my husband, Joel Marshall. We're going to start with those introductions from the panel and then we're going to take questions from the audience after we go through a series of questions that we have uh, for them. Helene Deboisier Swanson, she's the CEO of Katrina's Dream, and she's the author of Walk the Talk. Um, and tell us a little bit about yourself, Helene. Well, first I want to thank Kamala, Joel, and Natalie, and the complete Equal Means Equal team for coming on board and co-hosting. It is with my great gratitude and thanks for helping to make this event take place. So having said that, my name is Helene de Boissier Swanson. I am a founder and the CEO of Katrina's Dream. I've been involved in the Equal Rights Amendment truly from my earliest days when my mother was involved in the founding of the first chapter in New York City. And my mother was also involved in the founding of the United Nations Youth Council with Eleanor Roosevelt. So I come to you as someone who has been involved in social justice around the world, and in particular working with faith communities and reaching out to the greater communities to bring social justice on many matters, but our main focus is the Equal Rights Amendment. Thank you, Helene. Next um, on our agenda here, we have the um, Reverend Jacqueline Norris Baker, 
from the AME, which is the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, she is a strategic systems environmental community strategist. Welcome, Jacqueline. Thank you. I want to um, thank Helene and Sharon Hill for reaching out to me to ask me to be a part of this wonderful discussion. One of the things that I want to say as an African-American woman who was born in this country, whose grandmother was born in this country, equal rights have always been a part of those enslaved women who wanted equality. I am a womanist. And being a womanist means that I've been a woman all my life. So have those who are enslaved. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we are moving on to Reverend Terry Williams, pastor at Orchard Hill United Church of Christ in Chillicothe, Ohio. Welcome. Thank you so much, Joel. My name is the Reverend Terry Williams, and I'm an ordained United Church of Christ minister. I'm pastor of Orchard Hill United Church of Christ in Chillicothe, Ohio, and I'm a faith communities organizer helping to equip and mobilize faith communities for justice, equity, and equality throughout southeastern Ohio and greater Appalachia. I'm also here as a member of my local League of Women Voters chapter, the Chillicothe Ross League of Women Voters, where we've been fighting hard for equal rights for more than 100 years. I am the child of a great number, a great lineage of hardworking, justice-seeking Appalachian women, and I am so pleased to be with all of you amazing justice-seeking folk here. I'm eager for the day when we can all tell the story of how the ERA was made law because of the constant labor of generations of community leaders like every single person on this call. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all being here tonight. And thank you for being here. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Nina Zaragoza. She's a world educator and the founder of Rise and Shine Ministries. Welcome, Nina. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Kamala. Good to meet you all. So I am Nina Zaragoza. I am the creator of Rise and Shine Ministries. Um, and part of what I do is go around the world and teach our children about the love of Christ and really raise up leaders for, for it from this generation for our future. And so um, just providing them safe environments to tell their stories, to connect to each other, and to reach out into their communities as, as servants. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Um, next up, we have Senator Patricia Spearman from Nevada. She's a Nevada state senator. Um, she's also a North Las Vegas mayoral candidate. Welcome, Patricia. Okay, so hi, uh, I'm uh, State Senator Pat Spearman from the great state of Nevada. I uh, am a ordained minister, former pastor. I am also an army veteran. Um, and I am very interested in equality, equity and voting rights. I've done most of that all of my life. And here of late, equality and equity have been at the forefront of all the pieces of legislation that I've carried and uh, pushed to pass. I think we're equal, all equal in God's eyes. And it's about time we start acting like it, so. Thank you, Pat. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask uh, three questions, but while we're doing that, please, uh, anyone out there, please in the chat room, put any questions that you have for our panel. And Kamala is going to be writing them down, and we're going to be asking those at the end of this series of questions. So when I ask a question, uh, you can feel free on the panel to unmute yourself and answer the question. Um, if we have any kind of you know, problem with people wanting to answer, I'll, I'll just choose who the person is. So um, the first question is this. In this moment, when we are pushing for social justice and equality across our nation, how have you experienced the role of religion and spirituality within this context? I have had nothing but positive experience from the church. In the year 2009 at the General Convention of the Episcopal Protestant Church of the United States of America, 
We had an exhibitor's booth and we lobbied for the passage of D042, which you can go online and Google, which calls for renewed support of the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment into the US Constitution by the church itself. And it was through the colleagues of the Episcopal Church Center while I was on my pilgrimage of 10,000 miles, I mean, 10,000 kilometers, that I was invited to attend my first UNSCW conference back in 2015. So I can truly say that yes, the church has been most supportive and continues to champion women's rights and a number of social justice issues here in the United States and around the world. Thank you very much. Um, Elder Jacqueline, do you have something to say about this? Yeah, um, one of the things that I will say that I am African Methodist Episcopal, um, but I was also ordained in the Baptist Church, which my mother helped to start in Washington, D.C. on May 1st, 1968. The history of the African Methodist Church has always been one of social justice. It is the first church, Black church, in Philadelphia. So if you think about Methodism and John Wesley, social justice has always been a part of who we are, but especially African American women who have always fought for liberation and equality. So, um, that is what I have to say as it relates to social justice and the point of equality. But one must always look at the voices of the women who are ignored sometimes in the ERA. Those are the women who foremothers help to build the United States. But also those were the women who were watching the children why the ERA suffragist was out there marching. Thank you. Um, Senator Pat Spearman, um, this is great how you have the digital hand raised. Um, if you will, can speak to this next. <clears throat> so I, I believe that one of the things for me that um, religion, or I'll, I'll say faith, uh, is that it empowers me to do the work that we do and it is a North Star, even when I, I am frustrated, uh, when I get perturbed and I wanna quit, but it's a North Star because I believe that where we are right now um, with respect to our world, if we stop lending our voices, then I believe we have let down whoever the progenitor is of our faith. Uh, and for me as a Christian, uh, it is important to make sure that we take care of the least of these. And it is important to understand that God loves everyone. And that's why I fight for equality and equity. So it, it really is a strength. It's the strength and it is the power behind what I do. Because I couldn't do the work by myself. It is not me. I could not do this by myself. Thank you. Um, Natalie, did you have something to say? I just wanted to bring up, you know, I um, went to the Fairmont Free Methodist Church. I was a, the John Wesley Medallion, who Jack Elder Jacqueline was speaking about. And, you know, it actually said unequal weights and unequal chains are both alike an abomination to the Lord. So it says right there in the Bible, it, it tells me that that the Equal Rights Amendment does belong in the United States Constitution if we were going by the world. Um, I don't know if anyone else has anything to add to that, but I just wanted to bring that up. Natalie, I'll, I'll chime in. I, uh, even though I am a Congregationalist uh, and part of the United Church of Christ, much of my formative uh, religious education was through Methodist institutions. So I too am familiar with uh, with that that echoed statement, and I find that often people do not reconcile what their faith teaches with how their faith gets practiced, and I I feel the tension there. You know, um, for me personally, in the United Church of Christ, my denomination has always supported. Uh, the Equal Rights Amendment. We were, you know, some of the earliest uh, folk fighting for for that in the wider faith movement. But I recognize personally in this region, especially, 
there are a lot of religious institutions that still don't have full equality for women in the priesthood, that don't have full equality for women in uh, the work of the church, that don't have full equality for a whole lot of other folk too. And it always strikes me as a tension because those lived out ways of being are in direct contradiction to a lot of, of the faith or spirituality statements I think that we make. Personally, I draw a distinction between religion and spirituality because I, I think religion often uh, becomes that institutional part of how we express our spirituality. But our spirituality is how our conscience finds voice in our behavior. And for me, regardless of what your spirituality is, there's something that's just deep inside that's crying out in, I believe, all of us that says equality makes sense. Equality has that gut check. Equality is essential, and we ought to live into that. Uh, you know, whether it's through the beautiful words that, that we have from our traditions or from new words that we impart from that divine inspiration, we've got to find a way to allow that spirituality to come out and to move us to full equality. Elder Norris, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, um, when you look at spirituality for me, the um, African-American race have always looked at God being a protector of them. They are, you know, um, they look at Jesus, they look at um, how they had to worship in the bush. So spirituality is a part of who we are. If you think about the drum, if you think about the <laughs> clap, those are the things that we, as a particular race, look at as spirituality. It is not the Eurocentric reality. It is one that looks at, if you think about when the Israelites was in the wilderness, they knew that God would deliver them. And even today, we are looking at the process of spirituality and how God looks at the particular people who are being targeted by so many different things, but especially women. Women are the backbone of the African-American church and their voices is one of the things that I look at as relates to ERA, is that their voices must be heard, but then they must raise their voices and not be afraid to speak to the power to be. Thank you for that. I think that's true. Um, I wonder just, whether Nina would want to speak on <clears throat> being not afraid. Nina. Yes. Hi, you thank speak you. On that? Yeah. Yes, well, um, connected to um, what a few have already said, my faith is what drives me. My faith is what drives my work. It's not, it's not about me and it's not about my strength. So I, I walk out in trust and I look for doors that are open and just know that God, as some, as you just said, um, God is my protector, and and He 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 appoints us to watch over the marginalized, to watch over the widow, to watch over the child, to the prisoner, to the sick, to the elderly. So when the doors are open to go meet those though His people, then I walk out and. Um, he has given me the strength and the faith actually not to be afraid because I, I, I go to Haiti and to, to refugees and, and just uh, as many of us do, just reach out to them in love and, 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 and help them to be empowered and strengthened in who they are and who they've been created to be. I think um, the interesting thing about the uh, civil rights and equality, equal rights movement, uh, interesting thing about that is, and I believe it was uh, Elder Jacqueline Norse, uh, is that women, for the most part, have been leading the effort. And it reminds me of the scripture in the Bible that says, the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And so some of the most unlikely people uh, whom everyone else would say, well, you're, you're not worth it, or, or you have to look like this, you have to act like this, you have to do that. And so I'm looking around, especially in the ERA movement, I'm looking around at the ERA movement, and the women, the women who are leading the charge uh, are people who 
who have been told, and I say myself, who have been told that God can't use you, that because of who I am uh, and, and how I honor my truth, that it would be impossible for God to use me. But the stone that the builders rejected all across the country and even across the world, the stone that the builders rejected, the one that they threw away, those are the stones that are now becoming the chief cornerstone of this equality and equity movement. And I think that that's very interesting. All right, great. On that note, we're gonna move on to the next question. And remember, you can also ask questions in the chat room if you have something to um, add to this discussion. Um, number two, this is the number two question. Why is the Equal Rights Amendment in harmony with your spiritual beliefs? And how do you think the spiritual and religious communities can be involved in this struggle. Pat, can you speak to that first? Yes, and, and I'll just say this. I, I think um, for me, faith communities are supposed to be the headlights, but many times we are the taillight. We wait for something else, another organization or someone else to um, attack the inequities and inequality in our, um, in our society. And I believe that what we should be doing is using that power. Uh, you know, Philippians 4 and 13, now, now uh, you know, unto Christ who can do, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so if you can do all things and you see something that's wrong, then I think you should start to do something about that thing that is wrong. Um, there, there's just no way for me, for me, okay? Just no way that I could say that I am a follower of the um, founder of my religion or my faith, which is Christ. There's no way that I could say that and then sit back and watch what's happening even today, even today, and not do something about it. So um, it, it, again, it's an animator. It's an animator. And we've got to become, again, we've got to become the headlight and not the taillight. Thank you. Helene, you're one of these people that stepped out and did something when you saw something was out of line. Can you tell us something about how somebody can do that and how your spiritual beliefs align with the Equal Rights Amendment? Oh, well, let's see. Um, well, first, I believe that faith communities are already involved. And, and we see this with the Episcopal Church. We see this in the Presbyterian Church with Terry. There's faith leaders here. So that shows there's already involvement. Maybe not enough, but folks are already involved and things build from there. So my belief is you have to get the laity more involved. I'm laity, for example. And that when the laity becomes more involved in their faith communities and, and step up to become um, on committees for outreach and social justice, or approach the elders or the leadership. And like in the Episcopal Church, we say vestry at your local church. You say, hi, I'd like to have a meeting with the vestry. You go to the vestry in the meeting and you say, hi, my name is, I have a concept. May I please put on a speak and during the coffee hour, can we have an event at the church and invite other congregations and reach out to them from there with that little meeting you have your committee formed, then you have your event, you reach out to the other faith communities and they reach out to their congregations. And as Jesus said, we take it to the people. Thank you, Helene. Um, Nina, how are your, well, just, just go ahead and say what you're gonna say. Well, what comes to mind is the scripture where um, Paul talks about some plant the seed, some water, and some gather the harvest. So I, I don't think it's about comparison about who's doing what and who's not doing what. I think it's that we're all, when we are, when we are followers of Christ, we, we, we fight for justice because we are all equal in God's eyes. And so, for example, I see myself more planting the seeds in this coming generation and, 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 and setting up equal communities, girls and boys that are serving each other and serving the larger community. And so planting the seed, other people will water it when I leave and so on. And, and we will gather the harvest. Terry, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, I, I just wanted to jump in because, you know, Helene, what you, you shared about activating the laity, I find 
as a Congregationalist minister, sometimes I forget that we're not speaking as clergy as clearly as we could be on these issues. I had a lay person a couple years ago ask me, you know, why have I never heard a sermon from you about the Equal Rights Amendment? And I had this moment where I thought, well, my gosh, I mean, we, we talk about equality all the time. We talk about policy all the time. And it dawned on me, ah, there are some people who are not hearing because I'm not being specific enough. So having that interplay between the laity and the clergy to say, no, we really have to say the thing, right? We have to name the thing. Um, I, I see a question in the chat that I just briefly want to work into this as well, a question around ideologies, right, of kind of the extreme ends of opposition to the ERA and whether or not that's hampering our work. For me, as an openly queer person in Appalachia who works with abortion justice advocacy and a lot of other, um, you know, progressive spaces, I find that the inability of progressive churches to name the thing and progressive faith communities writ large, right? Not just churches, synagogues, progressive mosque communities, faith communities beyond uh, Christian tradition too. The inability of progressive spaces to name the thing and really just come out and say, we support the Equal Rights Amendment. We support this being policy, not just a, a theory, but real equity that has hampered us, I think, more than anything. And when we start to name that laity and clergy and everybody in between, that's when the real change, I believe, is going to happen. Thank you. Ja uh, Jacqueline. Yeah, um, I want to quote something um, from Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, the first president of the National Association of Colored Women. She boasted in 1895, our woman's movement is woman's in that it is led and directed by women. And so for me, as I travel out and I go to communities, the first thing I look at is when I walk into that room, I am an African-American woman. And being an African-American woman, what I bring to this particular moment is that African-American women have to deal with sexism, they have to deal with gender, and they have to deal with fighting two places with patriarchal from the African-American males and from the European males. So African-American women, when they look at it or when I walk into the room or when I speak about equality, I speak from the experience as an African-American woman who have lived in the United States, who have um, know a grandmother who was a part of the club movement, including my mother, who said, men won't tell us what to do. We will direct ourselves. And that is what you see now. You see overseers of women in the church where the men are governing how they move and what they say. And until they raise their voices to say, this is how I see it, women's movement will not be birthed in the African-American church because it's not preached equal rights. Women's day is not equal rights. Missionary day is not equal rights. Do you ever find that uh, in the church you are maybe uh, hesitant to bring up ERA because it's a political, it's, people think of it as a political matter? Um, most of the people know that I talk about womanism and um, Wakanda, that I'm a warrior. So I bring it up in everything that I say because as an African-American woman, I will not allow anyone to take my voice because when I speak, I speak from my own experience as a woman wanting liberation, but I also speak for my daughters. However my daughters see me in a room as it relates to patriarchal systems, they may do that, but my daughters are strong. They know how to stand. So equality and equal rights is what I do and breathe every moment because it is a part of 
the African American woman's liberation movement. Thank you. Pat, do you have something to add to that? Yes, and I, I, I was just going to say, uh, and I think um, Elder Norris uh, hit on it uh, a few minutes ago. One of the things that I've noticed uh, being a church kid, growing up in church all of my life, um, and when I was younger, uh, I grew up in, quote, the Pentecostal church. Uh, I was also in the AME church for a while and in the United Methodist Church um, also. One of the things that, that I noticed is that faith communities, not all, but many, still are the bastion of suppressing women's not just rights, but voices and everything else. And so if, if, if you feel that you have a calling from God to do a certain thing, uh, even if they acknowledge that, many times they want you to stand on the floor. And so I think it's important when we start talking about the equal rights movement. And, and uh, I, I, I agree, Sharon, you know, equality is not the ERA. But I think what we have to do is we have to take the fights that we have already uh, gone through and what we've won and, and, and put that next to, it's got, it has to be not in juxtaposition, but it's got to be in concert with fighting for equal rights, equal rights amendment. It's got to be that. And for many in, in faith communities, that's scary because um, sometimes men have felt like this is the only place where they can really be in charge. And so I think it is important. It is important, Reverend Terry, you said, you know, to, to speak specifically about that. It is important to talk about the Equal Rights Amendment and to let people know this is not just something for one group or for another group, but this is something that has been commanded that we do uh, regardless of gender, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of your dialect and that sort of thing. And so the Equal Rights Amendment, ERA, I tell people it's not a political thing. It is not. What it is, it's a human rights thing because we're talking about people because of their gender not being denied to do, to go anywhere. And, and, and I believe as a faith leader for me, that's been one of the strengths in this fight because I can stand and say, I am ordained. I am a minister. I'm a former pastor. And when I was a pastor, I preached that all the time. And sometimes it would anger people, but I'm like, okay, grow up because this is the right thing to do. This is the right thing to do. So the ERA is, isn't about, it's, it's not about necessarily quote Christianity, Judaism, uh, Islam or anything. It really is about looking at the human family, the human family and the human family. We are all equal in God's eyes. We are all equal. And we've got to continue to fight for the ERA because right now the work has not been done. We are not finished, not until it gets into the Constitution. All the states, the necessary states have ratified, but it must go into the Constitution. And, and even after it gets in the Constitution, we still have work to do because you can, you can put something in law, but if people have not embraced that, their hearts and minds are still the same, then we still have the struggle. And so for me, when being a faith leader means using all of the things that, that I believe God has called me to do to say, we're not done with the work until the ERA is fully in the constitution and everyone acknowledges that equal does mean equal, period, full stop. That's great. Um, Jacqueline, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, um, what I wanted to add to that is that if you think about um, equality, and you think about the club movement of African-American women who were called colored women, they in a sense moved outside of the church to do the kind of things that they felt that they needed, not because they was against the church, they did things for the community. And another thing that I wanted to say is what has held me that I look at the statement of Jesus Give what is Caesar to Caesar and what is God to God. Now I understand government, but I also understand my commitment to the community. And having that commitment, it means that I as an African-American woman who has been ordained in the AME church and ordained in the Baptist church it was God who called me, just like God called Deborah to do something, just like God called um, Vashti to say no 
to something. That's an ERA movement. That is, if you look at Mary, Mary by saying yes to God and not having to ask permission from the brethren, that's an ERA moment. So if we look at life, women have to begin to say, God called me. I may be a member of the church, but I stand on the equality of God and refuse to be under discrimination because of my gender or my sex. Nice. So I want to move on. The, the, the virtual applause occurring. Um, I want to go on to now say, what can people do? What is the, the call to action that you would you believe would be the most impactful for those listening right here to engage in if they wish to become more involved in the fight for ERA. Um, I'm going to start with um, Senator Pat Spearman, see what she has to say about that. Uh, I knew you were calling me first. Um, so I think uh, the, the call to action really is don't stop. Don't stop. Uh, and as I said before, even once it is recognized, even once the archivist does what the archivist should do, uh, we still have hearts and minds. We, you know, Brown versus uh, the Board of Education in Topeka, Kansas happened in what, 1954? And we still have schools, public schools fighting for equity. Uh, and so just because it goes in law doesn't mean that we're done. So I think the call to action is don't quit. Don't quit and be very clear about what it is we're fighting for. We are fighting for the Equal Rights Amendment because, and all of those things that we've been talking about already, we've got to make sure that we fight. The ne next thing that I'd say the call to action would be um, people don't, don't, don't just wait for someone in elected office to say we'll help. My challenge, and I just spoke at another event earlier today, and my challenge to them is figure out if, if there is a calling on your life for elected office. Because many of the times the things that have to change only change initially through legislation, through statutes. And if, if you are really serious about doing the work that you say you want to do with the ERA, then just think about it. It's not for everybody. I will tell you, it is not for everybody. But if you feel that there is a call to move closer to where the fire is, where the danger is, if you feel a call to do that, then talk to somebody, run for office. And, and all the time, it doesn't have to be, you know, uh, the legislature it doesn't have to be the federal office, because right now, what, what we really need is all over the country, we need people on school boards so that once it is in the constitution, and it is mandated by the constitution, we will need curriculums to, to align themselves with, the con with what the constitution says. And that's going to mean we've got to make sure we're on school boards to help people understand you cannot erase history and you can't just say no because you don't like it. This is the law and this is what we're going to teach. So it's just, just my take on it. Thank you very much. Reverend Terry, um, did you ever give that sermon on ERA? And what do you think is the best call to action? I I did, but I'll tell you, I'm sitting I'm sitting in Senator Pat Spearman's church today because uh, Pat Spearman, given that given that call, don't give up. My commitment and what I I think people need to take away from today is you need to believe in the Equal Rights Amendment, right? Senator Spearman was clear, like this work is not for everybody. It's for people who truly believe. And that's what I always ask people, like, do you really believe if you say that you're you're engaged in this, do you really believe in the work? Because the main way that folk are trying to harm this work is by convincing us that it can't happen. They're trying to convince us that, oh, no, that's long gone. Oh, no, you've got too many obstacles. Oh, no, you're never going to win. Do you believe that we will win? When, when young adults in Ohio storm our capital with protests, the way that they make their presence known, they jump up and down and they say, we believe that we will win. We believe that we will win. You've got to believe that you are going to win this fight. 
in your community, not not way in Washington only, but like Senator Spearman said, we need you to win this at the school board. We need you to win this at the library board. We need you to win this at the county boards of health. We need you to win this in your community with the people you know in that local activism, because once we win it in one space, it's got to come to all spaces or it's not really won. It's not really accomplished. So I believe that we will win not just the one sermon, but every sermon in every place, in every space, because every one of these boards and committees and commissions, folk who disagree with equality, just as a fundamental base level, people who fundamentally believe we should not be equal, they are seeking positions of authority in those committees. They are seeking positions on school boards and on the committee that you can't even name at the city council. They are seeking ways to make sure that these systems stay entrenched. And we've got to make sure that that doesn't happen. I believe that we'll win. I really do. I think that that's a very important thing, believing that, you, that you'll win, that we'll win, because um, a lot of times there are people that tell you we won't. And you've got to got to have the information available to tell them in the in your yoga class in your uh, dinner parties you got to win everywhere with this thing because i know someone who's very inspirational to me camilo lopez all this whole time she's been saying we can do this and so many times people have said no it's over you can't do this and in every obstacle she overcomes did you want to say something camilo Yes, I want to thank you, Joel, for saying that, first of all, but I wanted to um, sort of bring in a different voice here for a moment, and that is somebody that isn't uh, working in the religious spaces generally, more of a uh, working in a, more of the secular world. And one of the things that when I thought of the importance of engaging with the faith-based community on ERA, it's because there is so much bad faith in the movement. There is bad faith in the politicians. There is bad faith in the women's organizations. There is bad faith in those providing the services that are supposed to be making life better for women. When VAWA, you know, when you spend $20 billion on something and the situation is worse than when you started, you have to look at the intention not being true. And what I believe that the, the religious and the faith-based and the spiritual communities, and I want to say, yes, the native communities, absolutely, all of these wisdoms are people that truly believe, that are authentic and real. And that is at such a premium at the moment. Um, if we can connect principle, because, because the faith-based community by definition carries the moral high ground. And with it, if they take on the ERA, they bring the principle with them into the conversation so that it can't be boiled down to these ridiculous, inane, um, sort of semantical arguments or legislative confusions or you didn't dot this I on this date and therefore no one is equal because you didn't get it done in seven years. Guess what? No one is equal. But when a religious person walks into that space and looks that person in the eye and says, we're not talking about that. We're talking about humanity and what is it to be a human being and how are we going to treat each other? Let's separate from these constructs and talk authentically about intentionality and evolution. And that is what is absent in the secular sphere. And on top of being absent, because we have a capitalist driven system, it's also degraded in the secular system. So if you appear earnest or sincere or authentic, you're a loser and a fool and no one will support you. But if the religious community were to join with those of us that truly have intent to get this done, we would be elevated by the glow of principle that, that is brought by 
the love of, of, of truly of God. And that's what we need. Amen. Uh, Jacqueline, can you speak to that? Yeah. One of the things that I want to say is that if we look at the League of Nations and Mary Churchill Terrell before even all of this started, African-American women, along with Hispanic and other women, were always talking about this particular situation. It may not have been coined in the way that we are um, saying it because different generations do different things. But what I would like to say that as we move forward, as it relates to me, I have to understand how this represents me as an African-American woman, because I will not give my voice to a Eurocentric ideology as it relates to ERA. I stand with them, but my voice and my particular group voice as it relates to that, I'm a Trekkie. Trekkie is Harriet Tubman, suffrage. So when you look at things, you have to look at that. And when you look at the indigenous, my grandson on his father's side, he's indigenous. So everything I do relates to the indigenous population. I don't see any of them here. And so when we open up the movement, because this is not a moment. And so we have to include the voices and rewrite the history that was left out. And that is beginning with the League of Nations and those colored women conventions that dealt with this issue. Helene, do you have some actions that people can do to yes, I actually push do this and, thing forward? Yeah, I actually do. And, um, and so my suggestion is one, first, I'm gonna highly recommend that everyone look at these following websites. The first one I'm gonna mention is equalmeansequal.org. The second would be Rethinking E. We'll have to Google that one. I'm sure if, I'm not sure if it's a .org. Jean's on the call, she can put it in the chat. And then I'd also recommend going to the Ross Valley Chillicothe chapter of League of Women Voters and check out their website. And then last but not least, mine. After you do some basic research, so you can get a full understanding of how many different groups are truly involved. And that this is not a small movement, but what we are facing is misinformation disorder and massive media that blocks the movement by not promoting it and not covering the story. It is a larger movement than most recognize. And so having said that, my first call to action, as I said, would be check out the websites, Google, learn. Then the next part would be to yes, um, I take a more um, passive approach, um, but not so passive really is to do the following. We really truly need to have folks calling our US Senate and they can call upon Senator Charles Schumer and ask that he bring it to the floor for a vote. And that number is 1202-456-1414 for the switchboard. And that not to stop there, but also to call on Senator Richard Durbin for him to hold hearings on SJ Res 1. Then don't stop there. I'm gonna say, yes, we have some other people you can call and that would be to call upon the president of the United States. I'm sorry, I gave the wrong number first. The first number for that number 202-456-1414 is the White House switchboard. Ask to speak to the gender council. Ask to speak and leave a message on the comment line. Call upon this administration to use and spend their capital in moving Congress to pass and remove the deadline on the RA as well as push for publication. And then call Senators Richard Durbin as well as Senator Schumer at the US Capitol switchboard. And that number is 
3121 and petition him as a, a Schumer to bring it to the floor for the vote and Durbin to hold hearings. There are lots of people working on this. We need everybody writing newspapers, reaching out to their network. I have a concept called the power of 10. It's based upon what I call the Jesus principle. Um, and that is I connect with no more than 10 people. I don't need more than 10. I call them up, I invite them, I educate them, and then I ask them to find 10. And so if we did the math, one times 10 is 10, 10 times 10 is 100, 100 times 10 is 1,000. If everyone here just dedicated themselves to finding 10 people that they could personally reach out to and activate and move to call the president, to call the Senate, we would have a massive wave that they could not deny. Thank you. Now we're gonna move on to questions from the audience. Um, Kamala has come up with some questions. I'm gonna pass that over to you. Okay. Our first question is from Madison Turunen, and it, it's this. In the U.S., the church has been used as a tool of progressive change, like in the civil rights movement, but also as a tool of far-right conservatism, especially in anti-abortion and anti-LGBTQ+, and trans legislation in the past years. Can you speak to your work combating this negative end, especially in relationship to harmful conflations that perpetuate discrimination and gender inequity? More specifically, is the ERA movement being limited by the far right's use of religion in their agendas? I'll just say this. Um, I believe that the people who, who misunderstand uh, biblical teachings and I always say to people, go back to the original language um, in what we call the Old Testament is really Jewish history, and that's Hebrew, and then go to uh, the New Testament, which we call, and, and the language there is Greek. And so you have to go back to the original language to see what happens. You know, I, and, I, and I always tell people, just because you put on a blue jacket doesn't mean you work at Walmart. And so you have to make sure that when people are coming at you and they're saying things that you know that are not true, you have to stand up. And, and, and the platform that, 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 that God has allowed me to have as a legislator, every time they come and they want to talk about that stuff, you know, well, God doesn't like this, God doesn't like that. And I say, you know, I go right back to, listen, take care of the widows, the children, take care of the hungry, feed the homeless. Y'all don't want to talk about that. What you want to do is you want to, you want to talk about what, who people love. You want to talk about what's, what they're doing with their bodies. And so let's get first things first. And I think that, I think that more people, and it's, and it's not that you take religion as it becomes politics, but I think, you know, politics is everything. You know, Jesus wasn't killed because, because of Christianity. He was killed because he wouldn't, he wouldn't tell folks that he wasn't the son of God. And it was political. So, so what to do is we've got to snatch the narrative back and say to people, this is what, quote, the words that we attribute to God to say, okay? Get this part right first, and then, then try to tell me something else. But I don't, I, I don't sit in silence when people, you know, when they get it all wrong, I don't sit in silence, not at all, not at all. You got the wrong one. <laughs> I don't sit in silence. Thank you. Who else wants to speak to this? Um, I'll speak to it. Um, one of the things that I think that we have to deal with as we think about the pandemic is that you have the evangelicals. And so when you look at what they were pushing and how they are trying to limit so much, when you talk about someone who is going against the grain, look at the particular individuals. One of the things I say that we must, uh, in a sense, understand the different religion and how each religion is posing the question. That kind of question needs to go to the evangelicals. Okay, Natalie. Like for instance, once um, Missouri, um, we were asked to speak at the state Senate hearings on the ERA. Uh, my father, um, who 
is a Sunday school teacher in the church, which I, you know, went to the Free Methodist Church through um, as a child, I received my John Wesley medallion. I, um, you know, was very involved in the church. Um, I, you know, while I was um, testifying in front of the Missouri Senate, I brought up all of these on, on equality, including Proverbs uh, 2010, which says unequal weights and unequal chains are uh, Lord. Um, I was met and asking for equality with the words of God screamed at by the state um, president of the state senate of Missouri I if I believe that the equal rights amendment should be in the constitution that I believe in killing babies um, which the equal rights amendment has nothing to do with abortion men and women are are you know biologically different we were met with asking for equality we were oftentimes met with great god um which i disagree with because jesus taught equality uh is equality um sure you can find some um some uh, uh verses in against that but in the new testament they taught equality um so you know religion as a weapon against equality uh this happened in virginia and this happened in missouri this is happening it's, it's scary because that's not what christians believe in that is what people and they're using, they're bastardizing the word of God in order to kill equality. Thank you. Um, what's the next question, Kamala? The next question is, um, and I don't know whether you think we've covered this, but do you have any ideas about how to engage the churches in this wonderful moment in history so that they can help to nourish and nurture this new democracy that embraces women as full citizens? And, um, you know, just to reiterate what I think uh, we got to, um, we mentioned publication by the archivist. That's important to pressure uh, the White House and anybody we can to urge the archivist to publish ERA before he retires, which is uh, mid-April. Also pressure uh, your senators because in 38 states, these the senators of the 38 states that ratified ERA are really not doing their job representing the women of their state because they are doing absolutely nothing to to just say you what's happened. We we ratified this amendment. Why isn't it being adopted? Why aren't these discriminatory laws being addressed? But because we have this situation that now. Um, we need 60 senators instead of 50 senators to approve something that already the entire country uh, wants, that 38 states approve. This is not really democracy at this point. So get on your senators and say, uh, do the right thing and make sure women are in the Constitution. It's high time. Those are two very important things. Um, also support uh, us. Um, you know, Katrina's Dream and Equal Means Equal and all the organizations represented here are the marginalized groups. We are the people on the periphery. We do not have uh, gold ribbon sponsors or uh, media or limos picking us up. We are those, uh, we are silenced often. Our voices are marginalized and made less of, and that's because we're extremely effective and we're about to win the Equal Rights Amendment across the country and then the world. And that's going to make a major power shift. So we have to understand our role as the gadflies, but still any support uh, makes the pain a little less. So those are the things that I, so if there anybody else have any other thoughts on how we can engage the churches in the ERA movement presently? Um, Kamala, I, I think personally as a pastor who has been called to account, right, for my 
my somewhat laziness, you know, and not naming the thing and not being, you know, direct about that. I think it's a great opportunity to call your faith communities and faith communities that you're connected with to account. There are tons of faith communities that are parts of uh, denominations and systems that have already taken public witness decisions at their synods, at their conferences, at their national gatherings in support of the ERA. The question comes to, so what are the local congregations doing? How are we locally having that dialogue and conversation to prepare people for the shift of, of the possible, right? There's this possibility window that opponents of the ERA want to narrow down and they want to move to the side and they want to sideline all of these very effective organizations that are broadening the possibility window that are saying, no, you know, we all want this, we all need this. That's what faith communities can do better than just about any other organization is broadening that window of possibility and looking at our senators, looking at our representatives, looking at people in positions of power and saying, why not? When so many people have agreed on this, we can't agree the, the numbers for the ERA in terms of support nationwide. You can't get those numbers on whether the sky's blue. I mean, it is just astronomical how well we are in harmony. Why can't we get this done if we all can really get behind this and agree as a nation? Why haven't we done it? Calling them to account. I think asking our faith communities to lead that challenge, that's where we begin call folk to account. Pat, did you have something to say? Yeah, and I, I was just going to say one of the things that I would um, always ask parishioners every church that I pastored, um, if, if this church burned down, and I'm not suggesting that you do it, but if this church were to go away today, someone passing by the former location, would they recognize that it was gone? Would they miss it? Is there anything in this neighborhood, is there anything in this community that they would go back and say, if that church wasn't here, then we wouldn't have. And so, so I think the other thing that churches can do is to recognize that we have to become relevant again, relevant in the lives of people. And the ERA, you know, I say, I say to people about the ERA, equal pay is part of that. Yesterday was equal pay day, equal pay day for white women. OK, you still got you still got to wait until August, you know, for uh, uh, for black women. And then I think it's September for uh, for Latinas. So so the relevance has got to shine through. And if we're not being relevant with the message and it doesn't mean that you, you don't change the message, but you have to make sure that it, it is relevant. And if it is not people, people don't even listen to us people will feel like, well, I don't really need to go. And, and one of the things that the pandemic did was it showed people, um, a lot of people said, oh, I don't have to go to church anymore. I can go to church in my pajamas. I can, I can, I can, you know, and so, and so unless we are doing the work, unless we're doing the work of, of making sure that, that God's kingdom comes here on earth, like it is in heaven, if we're not doing the work, we're not being relevant. And so, so supporting this, talking about it, making sure people understand what we're talking about when we say Equal Rights Amendment, we've got to do those things because we have to become re relevant. And it's not just relevant in the Black community, in the white community, uh, in, in the European, it's not just, re it's relevant, period. And I like what someone asked, you know, what about, the, what about the Indigenous women? It's got to be relevant, period. And that's why I say, you know, I don't, I don't like the word religion. Let's look at spirituality because the spirituality is something personal between me and God. And it is that relationship that tells me the relevance of the ERA is directly tied to the message, the social gospel. And, and absent that, I, I, don't, I don't know what we do. People pass by where the church used to be and, and, and they don't care. And, and, and I, let me say this. I think that's one of the reasons too why you see many congregations are dwindling. The ones that are dwindling are the ones who are still trying to do it like they did it 50 years ago. And people are like, uh, no, we're not going to use a typewriter. We're going to use a cell phone. Uh, we're not going to use a cell phone. What we're going to do is use a smartphone. And so, so just as everything else continues to evolve and get better, we've got to make sure that as a church, headlights again, headlights. If we're not relevant, then we're not doing the job right. Tammy Simpkins has her hand up. Do you want to say something, Tammy? Okay, thank you. And um, thank you so much for hosting this um, 
of this event. It's it's really moving. So thank you to Katrina's Dream and EME and everyone that's involved in this panel. Um, I just wanted to make a make sure that Terry didn't uh, be not beat himself up too much, but I do appreciate him stepping up and saying that the word ERA needs to be held um, out in the in the limelight, <laughs> you know, so I really appreciate that. But I wanted to say something about the church and say that for somebody who was brought up in the church also, I was in the Methodist church and then kind of got away from it as I got a little older. Uh, Terry's church was the first church I actually really attended and it was online. So while I know that it makes the, the regular churchgoers often maybe not, you know, maybe you're lazy and they can't get together, whatever, it, it is also a really, really great tool. And I, and I appreciate it with um, what I've been going through on a personal level. So thank you all. And thank you, Terry. And please get over thank to our you. YouTube portal and um, check check everything out. Um, the Katrina's Dream Portal. There's um, all kinds of exciting um, videos up, and people are connecting. And um, our local league does have a presentation up. So if you would check that out, and and we are going to be having a live Q and A that EME is going to be. I'm helping us with on the 22nd um, and that for 30 p.m. Eastern Daylight. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Jacqueline, did you have something to say? Yeah, one of the things that I did to move it, um, I invited my bishop and a lot of pastors that I know, hoping that they would, in a sense, um, listen to this. Um, I understand protocol. Um, I am not speaking for the AME church, but I am an AME, but I'm also ordained in the Baptist. What I do is like the club women. I travel and I do things because God called me to it. So one of the things that I hope that most people did is that they invited churches to be a part of this because most churches, I grew up with listening to the social gospel. They don't preach social gospel. If you ask some ministers about social gospel, they'll say, I don't know. I went to a Catholic school, um, college, and they taught us social gospel, the theology of religion as it relates to social justice. That has been lost. And so if you think about a lot that the church needs to revamp, that is one of the things that we need to do. But this particular event needs to be shared with a lot of churches and let them make their own decisions. So when we're speaking about bringing it to, and I really want to thank the party who mentioned why are not other faith groups invited and is this Christian focus? I wanted to address that because I am multi-faith. And what I mean by multi-faith is I was, a, I was baptized Episcopalian, then later baptized Roman Catholic. Then I became a born-again Baptist at a Jimmy Graham revival. And then I found Nishi Ren Shishon of America, Namli Aho Renge Kyo. And I still attend Torah study at Temple Micah in Washington, D.C. via Zoom. And so as a multi-faith person, um, I find that all roads lead to Mecca and that they pretty much all say the same thing. Um, and so having said that, I really, I, my next step is I will be sharing this uh, video. I'll be including it on um, YouTube channels. I'll be sharing it with the folks at the upcoming general convention of the Episcopal Church this year, which is being held in Baltimore. And then I'll be going on to the Lambeth Conference in which many world leaders, heads of states, as well as other faith group leaders attend. It's a 
a conference that takes place about every 10 years. So I really do reach out to all communities. It is not just a Christian concept. It is a spiritual concept for believers and non-believers, for even scientists as they explore quantum physics are seeing how mysterious and miraculous the universe is. Thank you, Helene. Kamala, do you want to wrap it up with one more question? And then we're going to have to. Oh, just end one off. more. Oh, okay. Well, I think well so. um, okay. So there are, let's see. Um, so Moira Gill, who is a wonderful um, EME supporter and really has just supported Leisha Gooseberry, is just an incredible person. Her uh, question is. Do you believe the ERA will liberate LGBTQ people too from prejudice and bigotry? How do we square this with the anti-gay stream also asso often associated with Christianity? So I'll just quickly answer. I do believe that the ERA um, provides equality for all peoples, however they perceive themselves to be. And we even have Supreme Court agreeing with that, um, with us on that in the case Bostock, which occurred a, a few years ago, in which the Supreme Court said that sex did, in fact, encompass gender. Um, so we, we do believe that the ERA is for everybody, man, woman, um, you know, alien, uh, race, um, you know, three-headed, hydra, whatever, however, whatever chromosomes you got. We're going to call that a sex and you're going to be covered. So regarding the use of, um, of religion to browbeat the gay community and have that associated with Christianity, I think that um, what Elder Jacqueline said is absolutely right to start building up these, reconnecting this this important historic uh, relationship between social justice and the religious communities, because we wouldn't have a civil rights uh, uh, legislation without that connection. And we've lost that connection. And the fact that there are millions and millions of young black, brown and LGBTQ youth in the streets that are not integrated with this messaging is a loss for both groups, for all groups and for the whole society because those children, those young people are rising up with that desire and they need to be connected into this sphere, I, I believe. That's, does anybody else want to respond to uh, whether the ERA will liberate LGBTQ people from prejudice and bigotry? Oh, I'd love to do that one. Most, and I'm sure Terry would like to as well. <laughs> so yes, um, when we founded Katrina's Dream, um, my original board was Reverend Robert T. Coolidge, former archivist of the Monticello Association. He has hence passed. He was an openly gay man. He was instrumental in the founding of Integrity. He has started a number of gay rights movements. And he also paid for the DNA testing for Sally Hemings' children to be included as well as herself in the graveyard at the Monticello Association um, home. And then there was also Reverend Catherine Picard, a lesbian, um, and she was my spiritual director. I would not have ever embraced this ministry if I thought it was to leave out all or anyone. It has to include everyone. If it did not include my brothers and sisters and those who I love so dearly, I would not be behind this. And I, I just want to share the, the old quote. Um, I think it usually gets attributed to Rabbi Stephen Greenberg, um, but it says that homophobia, right, is but one small room in the much grander hotel of misogyny. 
and I find that to be as as an openly queer man in Appalachia, I find that to be very true that the hatred that comes to me as a gay person and to many of the people in my community, you know, folk who are trans um, in in many other spaces, gender non conforming, uh, non binary, that prejudice is wrapped up inside the misogyny that is being addressed. And the reason that folk fight so hard against this ERA concept is because of the root misogyny in the culture like that that is that is the heart of any opposition in that space and i feel that when you get to the root of that oh so many other heads of the hydra will fall um jacqueline yeah um i want to someone put in the um chat will it liberate black people um um we have always been one to speak against injustice. Liberation is a, an ongoing process. If you think about the suffragettes, Septima Clark, if you think about um, Fannie Lou Hamer, if you think about, um, who else is it? Um, but anyway, there are a lot of African-American women who spoke out against injustice. So we don't wait for people to liberate us. We liberate ourselves by standing up and speaking out. And so um, I hope that answers the person's questions as it relates to Black people. Kamala, it looks like we're on schedule for the end of the, um, the, the discussion here today. Um, okay. Did you have... Yeah, well, so I, I, I just want to thank everybody. I want to mention that... Um, that Kabi Hoffman is a, a wonderful ERA activist, and she had a question too, and Mary Ellen Locke, Elma Hairston, um, and Susan Grant. Well, we did Susan's, but I'm sorry not to get to yours, but I feel that they were somewhat covered in other conversations that we had. Um, I want to thank everybody for having this conversation. I feel like it is only the beginning of a very uh, rich font of support for ERA, uh, a font to build uh, a, a better society with uh, more integrity, more principles, um, more care for one another. And I thank you all for being involved and I'd like to invite you to stay involved by um, joining our organizations, you can join, join equalmeansequal.org on our website. It won't cost you a dollar and we can stay in touch with you. Uh, I know that I would like to join Reverend Terry Williams' Zoom church because uh, he is so impressive and uh, really, really a breath of fresh air. Uh, and I, I don't even go to church, but I'm going to be going to that one. And of course, uh, Senator Pat Spearman, who is the headlight of the movement. She is the tip of the spear. We all fall behind her and thank her. And of course, Helene Duboisier, who inspired Senator Pat Spearman by walking across this entire country by herself without any support because she believed it was right. And I salute her and I thank her and I thank all of you and I thank you, Joel for moderating tonight. Thanks everyone for coming. And um, I just wanna say, this is a very, very crucial time to talk about ERA because we are on the brink of printing this in the constitution. And so please inform yourselves, please thank you all for being here. Please spread the word to all that your different religions and your churches, please talk to other churches, as we've said here today. Yes. Um, there's a wonderful musician. She has some videos. And so as an issue and she's shown of America, Nam Myoho Orange Kyo. Thank you so much. I wonder if, if um, I'm going to put you on the spot, Terry. I wonder if you uh, do a little prayer here at the end of our discussion. Absolutely. And I, even though I am Christian, um, I would like to offer an interfaith prayer, a word for us, a centering and a grounding. 
because so much of this work will wear you down. But I want you in this space to hold yourself. I want you to hold yourself knowing that you don't have to hold yourself alone, that there is a whole world, a community, a communion of creation that is longing to hold you. And there are frightful, terrifying parts, but there are joyous, healing, wondrous parts as well. And those, those are the parts which we bless and pray might grow. May you love so much that you love nothing too much. And may you trust so much in the future that you know you're holding now that you fear nothing else at all. In the name of all that is righteous and good and whole, in the name of the mother that holds us all, Amen, Ashe, blessed be.